with Peter Credlin. Welcome back. You're watching Credlin. Well, under new proposed legislation, micro parties may find it more difficult to have their candidates elected under laws that would ban the controversial practice of preference harvesting. Now, essentially, this is the act of striking backroom deals to funnel votes to certain candidates. And the result is it can increase the likelihood of being elected for minor party candidates and high profile independents who sign up. For more on this, I'm joined by the chair of the Federal Committee, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, Senator James McGrath. James, this is a, a new bill that was introduced into the Parliament in Victoria. It happens, as we know, federally as well, although you don't have legislation like this. What do you make of the bill today? Yeah, the, the bill's introduced, ironically, by uh, uh, someone who's uh, benefited from, from preference deal, uh, that being uh, Fiona Patton. And, and she's admitted that it, it might cost her herself. She's, she's used Glenn Drury, the, the uh, infamous uh, preference whisperer. I'm actually not opposed to this bill. I don't like the fact that, that shady deals can be done in shady rooms by shady people being paid money. Uh, when you come to the democracy, there's nothing wrong with, with parties swapping preferences. The, the Liberal and National parties obviously do it out, outside of Queensland. But when it comes to these, these dodgy deals between uh, minor parties and, and you get parties like the Motoring enthusiast, enthusiast Party elected or the Sex Party, you sort of have to wonder, are people playing democracy? And democracy is not a toy. It is something to represent the views of people and not, not mm. to be used by people to get a paycheck for three or six years. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you think you need something like that at a federal level? Uh, well, uh, federally for the Senate, uh, one of the reforms that's, that's come in that the government brought in from 2013 is to stop uh, these deals being done actually in the Senate. So it gives the voter the, the, the power to make sure they decide where their preferences go. So you no longer in the Senate lodge preference tickets, which has stopped mm -hmm. uh, some of the minor parties getting through and playing the system. Uh, one of the things we certainly could look at at, at, at a federal level is, is whether optional preferential voting comes in. It's something that, that my party uh, strongly supports. Uh, there's things like that we can do. We can also make sure that it is that, that while we don't want to stop people registering political parties, we've got to make sure these small political parties are genuine and are not being used mm, by someone mm. to try and get themselves a job for three or six years. Or that they have a name that sort of is attractive to someone going in and just having a throwaway vote, but they bear no relevance to the, the title, uh, to the individuals behind mm. it or its broader platform. I want to talk to you about issues regarding the integrity of our voting system more generally. We've seen a lot of debate about this coming out of the United States. We're not the US, of course. We've got the Australian Electoral Commission. It sets all the rules, but it doesn't mean we're immune to, for, to the risk of fraud. In the 2016 election, there's an interesting statistic. There were more than 18,000 cases of apparent multiple voting. Now, we know that in elections in the past, 2016 and others before that, um, you can have a whole lot of people refer to the AFP regarding these allegations, but very, very few convictions. Why aren't we adopting previous recommendations, James, of your committee that requires voters to have photo ID to go on the roll and also photo ID to vote on polling day? Uh I don't know, but I, I, I can't prejudge uh, my committee's report that's going to come out in a couple of weeks' time. But I'd be very surprised if the government members of that committee did not, re of my committee, did not recommend that we bring in photo ID. Most Australians expect to show photo ID when they go in to vote. They know they've got to show it when they go into the surf club or the bowls club. Uh, goodness gracious me, you, you go into a cafe now, you've got to register yourself and make sure you're there. But we don't do anything, sim that, that type of, of protection of the electoral role or the voting system when it comes to our federal elections. It's completely balmy. So, yes, we should have a photo ID so when you go to vote, you can prove who you are. Mm. The state seat of Bundaberg here in Queensland was lost by nine votes. Now, I'm not saying there was any electoral fraud or anything like that, but when you look at the instances of multiple voting, which we'll find out eventually, seats can be played. And we've got to make sure that our electoral system is not only fair and transparent, but it is seen to be fair and transparent. And the best way to do that is by making sure voters have voter ID. And the question actually is on the other foot. 
Why are people opposed to voter ID? What have they got to hide? Because the Labor Party, it's vote early, vote often, go to the death notices, see who's died recently, and, and, go and, and make sure that votes get exercised on the behalf of the dead. So, you know, it's up to the Labor Party to say why they are opposed to making sure this extra protection is, is, is brought into our, our electoral system. Well, just on that, I mean, they've had a recommendation in relation to the, the rorts and branch stacking in the Victorian Labor Party, a, a voter ID or, or membership ID, requirement for ID before you can join the Labor Party. That's a key recommendation. So it would be hard for them to oppose it in relation to the electoral role if they're prepared to look at it as part of uh, joining up to the party in Victoria. But, but I'll go back to that point. You know, where is the digital role? So that if I go to a booth in one part of the electorate, I can't then automatically, you know, drive across town and go and vote in another booth on the same day. If you have a digital electoral roll, I'm not talking about electronic voting, you know, still pen and paper, but I'm talking about going in and getting my name signed off. Why isn't that done digitally so that I can't go and vote and then cross town and vote somewhere else? I, I agree with you about the importance of having an electoral roll and there is a, a, a trial that has been happening with uh, uh, what's called the ECL, the Electronic Certified uh, uh, Roll that is that is being looked at. The issue that, that mm. I understand is actually cost uh, and that's one of the things but it's something oh, that I would not be surprised on, if... Oh, come on, James, you've joints... got a trillion dollar I... debt. You are heading towards a trillion dollar <laughs> debt. Come on. We're talking about a couple of iPads per polling booth for the integrity of our democracy, mate. Mm. Um, mm. I, I want to go to Clive Palmer, but just quickly, on all of this, um, I know where you sit historically on these things and I support, and I'm not going to ask you to preempt your report, and I, I think you're headed in the right direction. But this was a recommendation after the 2013 election, it was a recommendation after the 2016 election. We're now doing another report, mate. It's the 2020, and you'll be at the polls probably before any legislation can be moved. If the Liberal Party thinks it's such a good idea, you are in government. Where's the bill in the Parliament? I, I agree with you, and I strongly agree with you, and, and, I, and I share your, your frustration. Uh, the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, which will, which will hopefully, well, not hopefully, will come out in, in the next fortnight uh, without prejudging, mm. and as I've said, it, it will then be... Yes, I'm part of the government, but it's up to, to, to my government and I'm going to push for it. And if, and if the government doesn't have the political will to do it, which I'm sure they will, I'm sure Prime Minister Morrison will, well, I'm, I'll bring in my own private members' bill to make sure this happens. And I know it will be supported yeah, yeah. by a lot of my colleagues because they share the views of yourself and the people who are listening into this program because they know there is nothing wrong with showing photo ID to vote because our voting system is far too important to, to, to make sure we don't... Add these protections into it. Uh, if I just go by my Facebook post in response to this network, there's a huge support for more transparency, not less transparency. Uh, just quickly, I know you're up on the Sunshine Coast, Clive Palmer's Coolum Resort. There's been a battle royal there since he bought the resort uh, in 2012. It looks like, though, some of the people are going to uh, get some recompense. What's the feeling on the ground up there? I know when I've been to Coolum, people are devastated at the loss of those jobs out there at the resort. Is this uh, the end of things? It's 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 hopefully the end of what has been a very ugly chapter. And what I mean, I still call it the Hyatt Coolum because the Hyatt Coolum, mm. for those who who never went there, it was such an institution on the Sunshine Coast. And what happened there with its its. Uh, uh, that the way it was handled by, by, by Clive, the jobs that were lost, the impact on the local businesses. For these unit holders, uh, I am so happy that they have got a deal here uh, mm -hmm. that they can move on with the next chapter of their, 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 their lives because they were treated appallingly. The local community was treated appallingly. And, and let's hope we can just move yeah. on and, and, and try and re rebuild the past for a better future on, on, on Coolum. Yeah, James McGrath, thank you for your time. Thanks, Peter.